Hello, Facebook audience. I'm a little early today. If you're watching the archive, uh, fast forward seven minutes, exactly seven minutes. Otherwise, you'll be bored for the next seven minutes. If you're listening live, stay tuned. We will begin at 3.06 p.m. Eastern Time precisely. 2.06 Central, 1.06 Mountain, 12.06 Pacific Time, 11.06 Alaskan Time, and 10.06 a.m. if you're listening in Hawaii. Just got to cover all bases here. Actually, Puerto Rico, I think, is at 4.06. Be back in a bit. Gonna be a good show today. Hey, Mark, do I still have to check TV as well or just radio now? I think just radio. Okay, to get it to like pop up when it's active. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of a test run. We're gonna we're gonna check tonight to see what worked and what didn't work. So if anything's not working, uh, make sure you make a note of it. Tuesday, September 11, 2008. You got it. I have already. So if you're listening on Facebook, again, we'll be starting in about five minutes from now. So again, hello, Facebook audience. We'll begin in about four minutes. I'm explained further when I'm on the air, but this week is devoted, really the whole week, depending on how much we get through, to the brilliant and heartwarming speech that I was going to say our president, but um, let's just say our former president gave. Um, a few days ago. It was inspiring, if a little sad. Our last American elected president. That's right. Our last elected, our last, that's right. The last president chosen by a majority, chosen by the American people. There you go. The last president chosen by the American people. By a majority of the American people. It was um, four days ago. God, it seems like it, 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 oh, the speech already seems old. <laughs> yeah. The last president chosen by a majority of America. the last democratically elected president. That's good. Yeah, that, I like that. Mm -hmm. Elected on the basis of democracy. Hello, Cynthia, Diana, and Steve. Thanks for listening in. We'll start in three minutes.
One minute, folks on Facebook, one minute, we begin. with Mark Levine. All right, Mark, I'm going to pot you up and you go when you're ready. I'm ready. Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop from Washington. I'm your host, Mark Levine, reporting live from the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C., Today, of course, is September 11th, 2018, 17 years ago, terrorists attacked uh, New York and Washington, D.C., and uh, American heroes uh, stopped a plane in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and really our country was never the same. We do remember our fallen heroes, but we also remember, and we should always remember, that as horrific as the 3,000 Americans who died that day was 10 times that number or 30,000 Americans die every year at the hands of guns, whether by murder, accident, or suicide. So we do remember our fallen heroes. We've, I've talked a lot about 9-11 in the past. That's not what this show is about today. No, this show is about hope and change. Remember those words? No, think back, think a long time ago, think back to under two years ago when Barack Obama was president of the United States. It seems like ages ago, doesn't it? Doesn't seem like it was just two years ago. But when I heard President Obama speak a few days back, couldn't help but reminisce, couldn't help but remember the way things were. Now, I've got three shows today. It's going to be a really special week. We've got shows today, Thursday, and Friday. So um, we've got time to really analyze this speech. And I think it's important. I think it's important, one, because I think we focus so much sometimes on Donald Trump that we forget what an intelligent, kind, honest, caring president even sounds like. Heck, sometimes we forget what a sane president sounds like. We forget humor, real humor, sweet humor, not humor that puts down others. We forget intelligence, a president who knows how to discuss complicated concepts and reason with us, reason. I think it's been at least five years, maybe 10 since I took an entire speech and dissected it on this show. I've done it in the past. I remember I did it with Al Gore, how many years ago? 10 years ago. And it was a long speech. The speech was an hour and five minutes long. So it's gonna take several days. And we're gonna play the speech in its entirety this week. Now you may say, well, Mark, I heard the speech. It was fantastic. Why, why should I sit here and listen to you? on the radio or on Facebook or on Progressive Voices? Well, the answer is I'm not just going to play the speech. I'm going to comment on the speech. So you'll get it annotated with my commentary. But even if you've already heard it once, I think you don't want to hear it again. What he says is so thoughtful and so intelligent that it's worth reflecting on. And hopefully my comments today will help in that reflection, you're, of course, always welcome to call in as well with your thoughts at 888 mark 888 We will not finish the speech today. We'll go through a good part of it. But 
I don't know about you. When I hear someone give a speech, particularly a political speech, I'm always thinking, okay, yeah, I agree with you there. No, nah, I don't agree with you there. Uh, I agree with you, but that logic really wasn't great. You're on my side, but that's not the argument I would have made. Or I might have expressed it a little bit differently. When I heard President Obama Friday, I felt like he was reading my mind, taking my soul and putting it out there. And I know when I can't express anything better. I mean, I work really hard to express myself well, but watching President Obama, he said everything I wanted to say and more. And he said exactly how I wanted to say it. He talked not just about Trump, but the people who support him and the people who support us and the folks on our left and folks who don't vote and all the things that I've been saying now for years encapsulated in one beautiful speech. So I thought, well, you know what? <laughs> when you're watching and listening to the master, I need to shut up and let you hear the 44th president of the United States. There's a lot of wisdom in what he has to say. And if you haven't heard the entire speech, I hope you'll enjoy this well as much as I do. Don't worry, though. I'll be, I'll be coming in and out and stopping the speech and making comments. I want you to note first that he begins with humor. He begins with the ILL chant for Illinois. That's, that's you know, he knows where he is. Not like oh, oh, Trump, who sometimes forgets what place he's in. He knows where he is. He's speaking to a hometown audience. And listen at the beginning, before he says anything meaningful, just the compassion when he speech, speaks, the love, the gentle humor. Barack Obama was never about putting people down. He was always about building people up. Ladies and gentlemen, the 44th president of the United States. Hey. Hello, Illinois. ILL. Okay, just checking to see if you're awake. Please have a seat, everybody. It is good to be home. It's good to see corn, beans. I was trying to explain to somebody as we were flying in. That's corn. That's beans. They, they were very impressed and my agricultural knowledge. Uh, please give it up for Amari once again for that outstanding introduction. Beautiful young man. Uh, introduced him in a really very nice speech. I have a bunch of good friends here today, including uh, somebody who I served with, uh, who is one of the finest uh, senators in the country, and we're lucky to have him. Uh, your senator, Dick Durbin, is here. I also noticed, by the way, uh, former Governor Edgar here, who I haven't seen in a long time, and somehow he has not aged, and I have. It is great to see you, Governor. This is, by the way, standard politician. I want to thank, you always uh, thank President the people that are Colleen there with you. Everybody in the room. at the U of I system good manners, for really. making it possible for me to be here today, uh, and I am deeply honored uh, at uh, the o Paul Douglas Award that is being given to me. Uh, he is somebody who set the path for so much outstanding public service uh, here in Illinois. Now, I, I want to start by addressing the elephant in the room. I know people are still wondering why I didn't speak at the 2017 commencement. <laughs> the student body president sent a very thoughtful invitation Students made a spiffy video, and when I declined, I hear there was speculation that I was boycotting campus until Antonio's Pizza reopened. <laughs> so I want to be clear. I did not take sides in that late-night food debate. 
The truth is, after eight years in the White House, I needed to spend some time one-on-one -on -one with Michelle if I wanted to stay married. <laughs> and she says hello, by the way. Uh, I also wanted to spend some quality time with my daughters, who were suddenly young women on their way out the door. Uh, and I, I should add, by the way, now that I have a daughter in college, uh, I can tell all the students here, your parents suffer. <laughs> they cry privately. It is brutal. So please call. <laughs> Send a text. <laughs> we need to hear from you. Just a little something. I'm going to stop right there. I found that just so endearing, so sweet, right? He's talking to a an college audience, reminding them to call home in a very kind way to think of their parents suffering at home without them. You know, it's just basic compassion. Frankly, we probably wouldn't even notice it two, three, five, ten years ago. But in this day and age where we have a president and administration so anxious to tear us into little pieces. It's nice to have a former president who reminds kids to call home and think of their parents. We'll get to the meat of the speech right after the break. If you want to call in, it's 888-48-MARK, 888-488-6275, right back after this. He's a Bible-quoting, Constitution-loving, flag-waving, red-blooded, liberal American. He's Mark Levine. Give him a call now at 888-488-MARK. That's 888-488-6275. Hello, Facebook audience. I guess, um, special Facebook commentary. Mark Rimaldi, my wonderful producer, why don't you share with our Facebook audience what you said to me when I told you I was going to play this speech and you heard Obama just, just as we were doing testing for the first time in some time. I, I said it hurt, and it made me feel like I was hearing the voice of a, a girlfriend or – a soulmate that got away mm. or that I hadn't heard from in so long. And I forgot the type of emotions that they could make me feel so strong. And, um, uh, I felt pangs in my heart, in my chest. I really did physically, physically felt them. That's, I think that's very powerfully and well put. So I want, I want you to share that with our face. I love them. I do. I, I love, love them too. It's weird, you know, to love. I mean, it, it I is. mean, I've seen Obama once in my life and it was in a sea of several tens of thousands of people when he accepted the nomination in Denver in 2008. I think that's not true. I once saw him in Washington, D.C. as he was briefly, very briefly, as he came out from the same play I was in, actually, that I'd gone to see. Um, did not know he was in the audience. Um, Probably should have known, given the uh, you know the, the the big black car around and the the guys in suits, uh, but um, uh, anyway. But I I mean I haven't talked to the man, which is I mean I actually I've talked to and met Bill and Hillary Clinton. I've worked with Hillary Clinton. Uh, I knew her much better actually. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, he inspires us, and and yeah, it's. Um, a lot of love. He brings out the best. He really does. And, and one of the reasons why I'm really looking forward to sharing the entire speech, and I'm playing every word of it, folks. You're not missing any of it. It'll be over, over today and Thursday and Friday, is um, he also knows how to write a good speech. You know, it, this isn't one of those discursive Trump things that goes off in a thousand different directions. It's got its eddies. It's got its flows. You know, he begins thanking people as you must. He does a shout out to parents at home. But it's a very serious speech, and it's a very thoughtful speech, and one that made me think of – in fact, 
when I watched it, and I've seen the speech in full already, I'm listening for the second time, I would stop my my TV remote and actually think about what he had to say before I went on. It was so dense and so powerful, and that's why I'm looking forward to stopping it as we go along and, and sharing my thoughts. Um, he's very charitable, and that's hard to be sometimes to uh, those that support the current president. And yet one can be kind to people who are making horrendous choices without allow it, without dignifying the horrendous choices they make. You can dignify the person without dignifying their choices. They will be back shortly. When we come back, he talks about the first president, George Washington. Guess you got to begin somewhere. It's a beautifully written speech. As I, as I look through it and as he segues from one topic to another, it's really well done. I'm ready, Mark. And now, the voice of reason in an All right, Mark, here you go. Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. We're devoting today, Thursday and Friday, entirely to the speech by that kind, honest, sane, rational president of the United States that we used to have. Uh, here, of course, is President Obama. The truth was, I was also intent on following uh, a wise American tradition of ex-presidents gracefully exiting the political stage and making room for new voices and new ideas. And we have our first president, George Washington, uh, to thank for setting that example. After he led the colonies to victory as General Washington, there were no constraints on him, really. He was uh, practically a god to those who had followed him into battle. There was no constitution, there were no democratic norms that guided what he should or could do. And he could have made himself all powerful. He could have made himself potentially president for life. And instead he resigned as commander in chief and moved back to his country as state. And six years later, he was elected president. But after two terms, he resigned again and rode off into the sunset. And the point Washington made, the point that is essential to American democracy, is that in a government of and by and for the people, there should be no permanent ruling class. There are only citizens who through their elected and temporary representatives determine our course and determine our character. Now I want you to notice what he did here. He didn't just begin with the first president in order to begin with the first president. Barack Obama is making a point here, but he's also making several sub points that are just beneath the surface. The, the point is the one, well, why am I speaking, right? Everyone should know when you get up to speak, while you're speaking. He says the tradition is ex-presidents leave the stage. He is breaking that tradition. He's going to explain why. But he begins with the tradition, and he begins with George Washington leaving the stage and why he did that and why that's a good thing for democracy. And that's his surface point. But as we look below the surface, we can see there are several other points he's making. And not just the fact that he's quoting not just Washington, but uh, our other greatest American president, Abraham Lincoln, where he talks about government by the people, of the people, and for the people. That's, of course, from Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Barack Obama is making the point that this is all larger than one man, that the course of America, the course of our Constitution, the course of our whole enterprise right here in North America is ideas larger than ourselves. Well, he talks about the fact that George Washington could have been a dictator, could have been a president for life. There were no democratic norms. 
I certainly think he's referring to the current resident in the White House. He's making clear that George Washington did not see himself as above his country. He sacrificed himself for his country. He was commander in chief. He moved back to his country's state. He was elected president, and then he rode off again into the sunset. When Barack Obama says there's no permanent ruling class, he's making clear that Government is larger than any one of us. It's a lesson that the current resident of the White House will never learn. I'm here today because this is one of those pivotal moments when every one of us, as citizens of the United States, need to determine just who it is that we are just what it is that we stand for. And as a fellow citizen, not as an ex-president, but as a fellow citizen, I'm here to deliver a simple message, and that is that you need to vote because our democracy depends on it. Now, some of you may think I'm exaggerating when I say this November's elections are more important than any I can remember in my lifetime. And I know politicians say that all the time. I have been guilty of saying it a few times, particularly when I was on the ballot. <laughs> but just a glance at recent headlines should tell you that this moment really is different. The stakes really are higher. The consequences of any of us sitting on the sidelines are more dire. And it's not as if we haven't had big elections before or big choices to make in our history. The fact is, democracy has never been easy, and our founding fathers argued about everything. We waged a civil war. We overcame depression. We've lurched from eras of great progressive change to periods of retrenchment. Still, most Americans alive today, certainly the students who are here, have operated under some common assumptions about who we are and what we stand for. So now the president has laid out the thesis, the theme of his speech. He's telling you, you got to vote. And his whole speech for the next hour is going to be why you got to vote. And he's going to make an argument. He's going to make a rational argument based on our history, based on who we are. He says it's the most important election in the United States. He concedes that he has said that before, which is a great way to sort of admit that and then move on. But he's going to go through American history. He's going to explain to us why this is different, why we've been through troubles in the past, why we can see it through in the future, but only if we vote. You're not going to want to miss more of this speech. Stay tuned. We'll be right back right after this. My name is Mira Batra. I... I'm sorry, I was listening to you so intently, I almost missed the phrase. Oh, that's okay. I'm watching the clock. I am watching the I clock. I know you're always good, but it's <laughs> funny. I'm so used to doing this, and, you know, usually you're very engaging, but I don't know. Today I'm, like, sucked in. <laughs> it's okay. I need to get out in time. I got yes, out for those four who, seconds early. For those, uh, for those of you people. listening on Facebook, you know, as a producer, I've been very fortunate to listen to a lot of great shows and marks, but you know, sometimes just other ones just really get you, you know, and I think it's just this whole moment. You're just pining over Obama, oh. which is okay. It's all right. Yeah, but I think to put it in context the way that you are also makes it easier to do so. You know what I mean? Well, I'm trying to deconstruct the speech a bit um, because I think when you hear it, you can be overwhelmed with that emotion. Oh, there's so many layers when he right, speaks, Right, that's right. Too. That's right. 
So you can be overwhelmed with just the emotion of, oh, Obama, that you don't kind of see how he's taking this apart bit by bit. He begins with, you know, humor and welcome and brings people in. You know, uh, I was in Illinois. I know your fight song. I know your your corn and beans. Uh, remember your parents. I'm like your parents. But you know, you're so right about the, that touching moment because it's funny. I was on the other end of that, you know. Not too long ago, I say, but really half my life ago was when I first went away to college. And now, you know, my kids are only one in three. But when I miss them, I, I, you know, I really I feel it hard and I can't imagine raising them and then having them go away. And then all of a sudden they just don't, write they, they don't love you, but they don't talk to you at all. <laughs> so he's right. But he's of course he's right. Way, but but, but so, here's what's so sweet about it is. It's it's a universal thing, at least yep. you know. I mean, even if even if for kids who don't go to college to have kids move away yeah, from home, yeah, oh yeah, it's a universal thing. And what he's showing is that he's a man of compassion. You know, it just seems like every time exactly. Trump You're speaks, right. it's about him. It's, it's about complete, what can I do to help mm -hmm. me? Blah yep. blah blah. Why am I great? Right. And Obama, I mean, there's going to be politics. You know, it's coming in a speech, but. For a moment, it's just a little bit of human compassion. He's like, you know, exactly. hey, your parents, it's brutal. They're suffering. Listen to the words he used. They're suffering. It's brutal. kind of brings a little tear to your eye. It does. Like, yeah, oh, like, oh man, call we, your we parents. Call them, you know? <laughs> call your parents. And, and he's going just, through it himself. It's just you know? sweet. So, it's he's just, just a real guy. Can yeah. you imagine Trump saying something like that Impossible. ever? Impossible. No, I would faint. Impossible. And there and would be news stories about him sounding human. Before you know? we even get into the thrust of his speech, it's like, hey, I'm a human being. You're a human being. We both have compassion for one another. Call mom. Yeah, exactly. Call your mom. And it has nothing to, that has nothing it's to right. do with it's, it's he's just, not it's doing just, it for himself. No, it's he's just doing it for the basic. Parents. That's right. That's right. That's right. And plus, and, Mark, even when he does speak about politics, it really does feel like the reason he's doing it is for the good of the country. Well, that's right. Trump and we're going to get the reason he talks about politics is to serve himself. Exactly. Which is why, you know, when he brings up George Washington, that's exactly his it's point. Perfect, this was yeah. a person whose country came first perfect analogy. before himself. And that's why even if the, the, the text of the speech is uh, George Washington didn't talk and that's a good thing. And I'm going to violate that. I'm explain why it's important for me to break this rule. The subtext is because George Washington was a man of character and exactly. and uh, someone who wasn't a dictator, even though he could have been. Yeah. Whereas uh, Trump is exactly the opposite. He wants exactly. to be a dictator, but he can't be. That's right. That's um, exactly right. So so it's important to see that the subtext and not just the text. So it's it's it's. Get, I'm getting the feels today, Mark. Yeah. The well. Kids call them. Yeah. It's, it's good a, though. It's good. That's yeah. what drives people to action. Yeah. 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 And if you haven't registered to vote. Damn it! You better hurry. You better get your. It, that's together. right. It is. It is. It is. It is mid September. Most places st stop after you know after end of September. I'll get a web. There's a website. Register to vote. Yeah. yeah. I'll get, I'll get All right. Vote. We'll keep going. Okay. All right. Here you go, Mark. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. We've been deconstructing. President Obama's speech from last Friday because there's so much beauty in it, so many layers, and so much really to teach us. And one of the things I really like about Obama uh, is that he argues from history. He argues from facts. If you're a regular listener of my show, you know I bring up historical analogies all the time. People joke about, uh, you know, if something happens, no, no, that happened once before in 1843, and I'll give you the example because I think we have a lot to learn from history. And I think, yes, it may sound cliche, but it is true that those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So it's important to put this moment in context. We're going through hell right now as a country, but we've been through hell before. Civil War, Great Depression, McCarthyism, and we've managed to survive. And so now President Obama turns to our history to put the current moment in its proper context. Out of the turmoil of the Industrial Revolution and the Great Depression, America adapted a new economy, a 20th century economy, guiding our free market with regulations to protect health and safety and fair competition, empowering workers with union movements, investing in science and infrastructure and educational institutions like U of I, 
strengthening our system of primary and secondary education and stitching together a social safety net. And all of this led to unrivaled prosperity and the rise of a broad and deep middle class in the sense that if you worked hard, you could climb the ladder of success. Basically pointing out that liberal values, progressive values worked in the past, helped create the American middle class, helped for our prosperity. It's an argument about the past. And of course, it's also an argument about our future. But Obama is not one of those people who says, oh, and America was always great, right? He's going to turn, as he must, to be honest, and talk about the, well, the darker parts of our history. Now, not everyone was included in this prosperity. There was a lot more work to do. And so in response to the stain of slavery and segregation and the reality of racial discrimination, the Civil Rights Movement not only opened new doors for African Americans, but also opened up the floodgates of opportunity for women and, and, and Americans with disabilities and LGBT Americans, others to make their own claims to full and equal citizenship. And although discrimination remained a pernicious force in our society and continues to this day. And although there are controversies about how to best ensure genuine equality of opportunity, there's been at least rough agreement among the overwhelming majority of Americans that our country is strongest when everybody's treated fairly. When people are judged on the merits and the content of their character and not the color of their skin or the way in which they worship God or their last names. And that consensus then extended beyond our borders. And from the wreckage of World War II, we built a post-war web, architecture, system of alliances and institutions to underwrite freedom and oppose Soviet totalitarianism and to help poor countries develop. So now he is talking about the past. That's the text. I think we all know what the subtext is. The text is, yes, we had slavery and segregation. We cannot deny the horrors of our past, but we had a civil rights movement opening new doors for African-Americans, doors the current administration is about to close or trying to close. That's the subtext. Opportunity for women, Americans with disabilities, LGBT Americans, full and equal citizenship. Subtext, we know the president does not believe that all Americans should be treated equally. We know that he has specifically attacked immigrants and women and Americans with disabilities and rainbow Americans. He points that the overwhelming majority of Americans believe that we're strongest when we're everyone's treated fairly. And we know that the Trumpists don't believe in fair treatment of their fellow citizens. But again, he's just making the positive argument. Me, Mark Levine, I'm giving you the subtext. I think we know it's coming. He's laying out an argument. He's laying out that these are the norms. These are the norms that, um, that we have as a nation. And he's obviously going to point out quite soon that these norms are being violated when um, under the current situation. He even brings up uh, foreign policy, that we care about alliances with democracies, that we want to help freedom, that we want to oppose the evil empire, right? Soviet totalitarianism, Russian totalitarianism. We want to help poor countries develop. We want the whole world to live in freedom. And that's a clear, a clear distinction between the past and the present. Now, what he's about to say just adds another layer to the conversation. He's about to say that the old times weren't perfect. He's about to admit 
as only an honest person can do, that sometimes our wishes to make the whole world live in freedom led to mistakes like, like Vietnam. In other words, he admits that, that it was imperfect. And in doing so, he actually makes a stronger argument. Someone who tells you that the system is good but not perfect is someone you can trust. Someone who tells you the system is absolutely perfect just doesn't ring true. And it, it never is. So by conceding the imperfections, he actually makes a stronger argument for what he said before. Let's listen to him do that. And American leadership across the globe wasn't perfect. We made mistakes. At times, we lost sight of our ideals. We had fierce arguments about Vietnam. And we had fierce arguments about Iraq. But thanks to our leadership, a bipartisan leadership, and the efforts of diplomats and Peace Corps volunteers, most of all, thanks to the constant sacrifices of our men and women in uniform. We not only reduced the prospects of war between the world's great powers, we not only won the Cold War, we helped spread a commitment to certain values and principles, like the rule of law and human rights and democracy, and the notion of the inherent dignity and worth of every individual. And even those countries that didn't abide by those principles were still subject to, to shame and, and still had to at least give lip service to the idea. And that provided a lever to continually improve the prospects for people around the world. That's the story of America. A story of progress. Fitful progress, incomplete progress, but progress. And that progress wasn't achieved by just a handful of famous leaders making speeches. It was won because of countless quiet acts of heroism and dedication by citizens, by ordinary people, many of them not much older than you. It was one because rather than be bystanders to history, ordinary people fought and marched and mobilized and built and yes, voted to make history. So he's laid it out now. He's finished his historical argument. He's gone through and made clear that while it wasn't perfect, we all looked out for one another. We tried to make the world a better place. We cared about human rights. We cared about human rights at home and all over the world. And even if countries didn't abide by those principles, he said they at least had to give lip service for the idea. We shamed the Soviet Union and the Russians. We weren't praising Nazis. We were fighting Nazis. And he points out that's the story of America, a story of progress, fitful progress, incomplete progress, but progress. He's giving us hope. He's reminding us that we've done it before. And he goes on to say that it's not just a handful of famous leaders making speeches, and it wasn't. But for all we talk about Martin Luther King, we need to remember there was a civil rights movement before King and one after he died. It wouldn't have been achieved with just him. It's not about, we are not a country where one person leads the way. We're a country where ordinary people protest and lead the way. Well, whether it's the Women's March or Colin Kaepernick or the March for Our Lives, he's making clear that today's protests, today's fights, today's grassroots, which is stronger now than I can recall in my lifetime. I wasn't around in the 60s for... Vietnam and civil rights, I suspect that that's the last time it was this strong. But that this is our country. This is what we're about. This is our history. This is where we belong. He's taking the past and he's bringing it to the present with hope and progress. 
And he's doing all that so that he can contrast it. So he can contrast it with that of Donald Trump. And that's what he's going to do next, right after the break. A call. Actually, we won't take calls. We'll just finish the speech today. We'll do calls on Thursday. But we'll be right back right after this. He's a Harvard economist and a Yale lawyer. He does not keep up with the Kardashians. He's Mark Levine. This is John so this is our last break. Um, he, President Obama began as he should with hope and joy and progress and reminding us that um, these lessons of our past are very much true in the present, that the people protesting today, fighting for American values are indeed, we are the children of the past. We're the ones who made America great, as it were, although Barack Obama would never say those words because great is such a such a meaningless term. Oh, that's great. In fact, it's, it's, there's a reason why sarcasm, the word great, I think, is used. Oh, that's great. That's really great. Oh, yeah, that's great. 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 <laughs> We don't do that with other words so much, right? We don't do that with happy or successful. We don't, we're not sarcastic with that because great is one of those words that it, it has no meaning. It's great. It's just a superlative, an empty superlative, the kind that, I don't know, a child might use. No one says these words anymore, but when I was in my teens, now I'm showing my age, the big word was awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. Kind of a stupid word, given that whatever it was we were talking about was never as awesome as perhaps the word deserved. You know, Obama's not using words like great. He's actually describing greatness. He's describing people looking out for one another. He's describing progress. Yes, fitful progress. Yes, imperfect progress. He's describing America's past in a way that um, reminds us what we can do in the future. And when he comes back, he's going to uh, contrast this with Trump's America. So it's important to start with the positive, I think. It, you know, if you give a speech and you just immediately start attacking somebody, people aren't going to listen to you. But if you bring up the positive vision that we had and what you're trying to bring back, I just think that's a much more persuasive way to, to give a speech. This is a very well-constructed speech. And we'll be back with it and the dark turn our country took in just a few minutes. And given my pace, I may need more than three shows to finish this speech. <laughs> That's okay. You on Facebook get this extra little commentary. Stay tuned. We should be back in just about a minute or two, if I've calculated correctly. Ready, Mark? Ready. Here you go. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, playing President Obama's speech in full today and Thursday and Friday. There's just so much to unpack here. 
President Obama has talked about the progress that's been made up to this point, how that's progress of ordinary citizens helping their country. And he turns then, as he must, to the heart of his speech. And that's how we went off the rails. Of course, there's always been another darker aspect to America's story. Progress doesn't just move in a straight line. There's a reason why progress hasn't been easy. He's, he's tying the present, again, just as he tied our good parts of our present to the past, he's also tying the bad parts of our present to the past. And why throughout our history, every two steps forward seems to sometimes produce one step back. Each time we painstakingly pull ourselves closer to our founding ideals, that all of us are created equal, endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. Quoting the Declaration of Independence, of course. The ideals that say every child should have opportunity and every man and woman in this country who's willing to work hard should be able to find a job and support a family and pursue their small piece of the American dream. Our ideals that say we have a collective responsibility to care for the sick and the infirm. And we have a responsibility to conserve the amazing bounty, the natural resources of this country and of this planet for future generations. Each economic justice, health care, the environment, basic core progressive principles. Each time we've gotten closer to those ideals, somebody somewhere has pushed back. The status quo pushes back. Sometimes the backlash comes from people who are genuinely, if wrongly, fearful of change. More often, it's manufactured by the powerful and the privileged who want to keep us divided and keep us angry and keep us cynical because that helps them maintain the status quo and keep their power and keep their privilege. And you happen to be coming of age during one of those moments. It did not start with Donald Trump. He is a symptom, not the cause. Critical point. Critical point and something that I've been talking about. He's the symptom, not the cause. Trump is there because we allowed him to be there, because we've had a cynical Republican Party do exactly what he said. A few people are afraid of change. They're afraid of someone who's different. They don't want to, men who don't want to be equal with women, whites who don't want to be equal with blacks, straight people who don't want to be equal with gay people, rich people who don't want poor people to have a, a, a stake in America. But as he says, sometimes the backlash comes from people who are genuinely, if wrongly, fearful of change. More often, he says, it's manufactured by the powerful and the privileged who want to keep us divided and keep us angry and keep us cynical because that helps them maintain the status quo and keep their power and keep their privilege. That is the story of the modern Republican Party. It's exactly who they are and what they've done from Richard Nixon stoking racial fears through Newt Gingrich, through Donald Trump. You know, most Republicans don't believe in Trumpism. The vast majority, including elected officials, tell me behind the scenes, they know he's an idiot. They know he's a narcissist. They know he's corrupt. But they can't tell you that publicly because they're afraid that their brainwashed supporters won't vote for them again. So who tells you the truth? Which Republicans? Well, John McCain before he died. Or Jeff Flake or Bob Corker who are leaving the Senate. It's critical that we understand, though, that this is not Trumpism is not about Donald Trump. Any more than uh, Jim Jonesism was about supporting that crazy preacher down in Jonestown, Guyana, who got everyone to drink Kool-Aid. There will always be charlatans. There will always be demagogues. 
It's the people who follow them. And it's a society that encourages people to follow demagogues. Donald Trump didn't even create birtherism. This ridiculous notion that Barack Obama wasn't born in the United States, that wasn't created by Donald Trump. That was created by other conspiracy theorists. He just capitalized on it. Or as President Obama put it. He's just capitalizing on resentments that politicians have been fanning for years. A fear and anger that's rooted in our past, but it's also born out of the enormous upheavals that have taken place in your brief lifetimes. And by the way, it is brief. I, when I heard Amari was 11 when I got elected. <laughs> and now he's like, started a company. <laughs> that was yesterday. <laughs> but think about it. You've come of age in a smaller, more connected world where demographic shifts and the winds of change have scrambled not only traditional economic arrangements, but our social arrangements and our religious commitments and our civic institutions. Most of you don't remember a time before 9-11 when you didn't have to take off your shoes at an airport. Most of you don't remember a time when America wasn't at war. Or when money and images and information could travel instantly around the globe. Or when the climate wasn't changing faster than our efforts to address it. And this change has happened fast faster than any time in human history. And it created a new economy that has unleashed incredible prosperity. But it's also upended people's lives in profound ways. For those with unique skills or access to technology and capital, a global market has meant unprecedented wealth. For those not so lucky, for the factory worker, or the office worker, or even middle managers, those same forces may have wiped out your job, or at least put you in no position to ask for a raise. So President Obama is pointing out that change is hard, and it's tough on people. And some that times that leads to the resentments lead to a demagogue like Donald Trump. Tune in Thursday, everybody, to continue the speech. In corporate world, when trouble pops up and things get sticky. All right, Mark. Awesome show, Mark. I'm looking forward to doing them with you we Thursday and Friday. Keep bud. going Thursday and Friday. I can't remember the last time I did this. I think it was with a speech by Al Gore. Yeah, you were saying Al Gore eight or like nine years, years ago. ago or something. I, I That's think, amazing. Yeah, but sometimes just it, the historical moment is such that we need Completely to listen necessary. to the wisdom of, of a very wise man and to really digest what he has to say. So that's why we're taking it taking it slow so folks absolutely listen come back thursday 3 p.m eastern time same same time same channel and we're gonna keep uh with more of the speech